Hello everyone. Before I start, let me just thank Omdina for giving me this opportunity to share my knowledge about the topic for today. And uh, thank you all for attending this learning session and making the time. So our topic for today is effective open source collaboration through Git and GitHub. So I'll be your speaker for today. My name is Rem Lampa. A little bit about myself. I'm a proud Filipino and I'm actually a career shifter. I was formerly a, an electrical engineer in the power in distribution industry, almost a decade of experience. So currently, I am a senior JavaScript developer for an Australian startup called uh, Prospel. I am also very active in the Filipino tech community. Uh, currently, uh, the community manager of Free Code Camp Manila, ReactJS Philippines, Tech Career Shifter Philippines. And just recently, I concluded the first season of my podcast. I'm also available on most social media platforms with my handle Remlampa. So if you want to reach out to me after this talk, you could just search for me with that handle. So enough about me, let's uh, get on with the session proper. A little bit of overview on what to expect on this session. So in this learning session, we aim for you to gain familiarity with Git and GitHub. We don't expect you to gain mastery over this next R, but I'm hoping that in some way you can gain some familiarity with the concepts. I also want you to develop comfortability with the command line interface and, of course, learn the basic Git CLI commands. And this one is very important since Omdina is a collaborative community. I want us Omdina members to be able to collaborate using Git and GitHub. And lastly, I want you to discover applications of Git in data science, which Omdina is basically in. So this talk is geared towards novices. If you are already an expert in Git and GitHub, it's still worth it to listen to these next slides because you might still pick a couple of concepts. So here's the breakdown of the talk. First, we'll uh, go into the definitions and the basic Git concepts and commands, and we will explore GitHub itself and look into tools within Git that can be applied in data science. And after that, I will show you recommendations on what to do next after this talk so that you can learn further. I'll also give some tips on how to accelerate your learning. And after that, we'll have a short Q&A. So the boring stuff, let's get that out of the way, the definitions. So what is Git? This is the definition in the Wikipedia page, I think, uh, if I remember right. Git is free and open source distributed version control system. Emphasis on version control system. It is a tool to manage your code base versions, specifically the version history. It is one of the, actually, it is the most used code versioning and collaboration tool right now. In a 2020 survey, around 70% of software projects, be it open source or proprietary software projects, use Git. It was invented by the inventor of the Linux kernel, Linus Torvalds. So if you're familiar with Linux, you probably know Linus. And yeah, he invented Git. It is very easy to get started. The basic commands, they could all cover around maybe 70-80% of use cases. But the rest is pretty difficult to master. But in time, you know, in, in continued usage, you could eventually gain mastery. Git is not the only version control system out there. There are also alternatives like SVN, Mercurial, and Subversion. I won't discuss that here. I'll, I'll leave those to you to research, but in my suggestion, in my opinion, 
just learn Git. So what is GitHub? So if Git is your code base version control system, GitHub is a service for hosting code bases that are versioned using Git. You could think of it as a Google Drive for Git projects. It is one of the leading Git service provider for open source projects. And just recently, it was acquired by Microsoft. There are competitors out there like GitLab and Bitbucket, but for open source projects, most especially, GitHub is the most popular. So on to the basic Git concepts. So everything in Git starts with the commit. So what is a Git commit? It is the most basic unit in Git. Put simply, it is a snapshot of your code repository or your code base. It contains information about the changes since the last snapshot or commit. It is represented by a 40 character hash and this hash, before I go, I go there, here's a, a representation on the command line in, interface of a particular commit. So we have here the commit hash that we mentioned, the 40 character commit hash, the author, the date of the commit, and the description. This describes the changes that were uh, applied during the commit. A commit freezes all these changes and stores them as a hash. The commit hash is generated from the following. The commit message or the description, the file changes, not only one or two files, it could be a lot of files, the author of the commit, the date of the commit, and this is very important, it also has a reference to the parent commit hash. Why? Let's explain later. But before we go there, let me show you how Git really shines in showing you changes between two different commits. This one is a screenshot of GitHub. Uh, it has a UI that shows changes that happened on the current commit versus the previous commit. It shows that line 19 to 25 were changed. Those highlighted in red indicate the previous state of those lines. Those highlighted in green indicate the new state of lines 19 to 25. So in the previous commit, the state was the ones highlighted in red. And this new commit, it overwrites that with the new state of line 19 to 25. Say in line 19, the author added the text 0.25x. Even though he added only a little bit of text, Git considered that line, that whole line changed. So it marked line 19 as a changed line. The way Git does that is it considers the previous state of the line as a removal and the new state of the line is an addition. In Git's uh, perspective, we have seven lines removed and seven lines added. This is still in GitHub. But in another view, the previous view was the unified view. But you can also view it in the split view, which is this. But it's the same. You have the commit hash here. And it has the parent commit indicated here. And the date of the commit, the description, and the author. As I told earlier, a git commit contains the hash of the previous commit. So there's a similarity there with blockchain. And actually, at least in my opinion, and some developers, Git is one of the earlier implementations of blockchain. Of course, the difference with blockchain as we know now is there's no cryptocurrency attached. But blockchain, the technology of blockchain or the concept of blockchain is similar with cryptocurrencies and Git. 
yeah, there's no crypto cryptocurrency involved, so there's no money to be uh, to be had here. Let me explain further. Here is an illustration of a Git history. Each block represents a Git commit, and uh, I've named it with its hash here. So we have three commits: ABA, 807, and 50A. So 50A is the latest commit, and its parent is 807. And 807's parent is ABA. If for some reason, and this happens, you manage to, to modify the history and change the parent of 50A, all the other information equal, the hash would still change. Because, as mentioned earlier, the hash is generated also from the hash of the previous parent. So if the parent changes, the hash changes. Let's go even deeper. There's a concept in Git called branches. You may think of branches as, you know, the branches of trees. But in reality, a branch is a pointer to a commit. So here, again, another block represents a commit. And we have master branch pointed to that commit. So master is a pointer to ABA. We also have here head, which is a special pointer, but I'll discuss that later. A git branch always points to the most recent commit of a particular chain. If you create another commit, say 807, master will then point to 807 automatically. And if you notice, head, which is pointing to master, also transferred to 807. So let me explain what head is. Head is like your point of view. Right now, at our point of view, we're seeing master. And incidentally, since head is pointed at master, it is also pointing at 807. We mentioned earlier that a commit is a snapshot of your code base. So whatever your code base looks like at 807, that's what master is pointing to. And that's what we are seeing because our point of view is pointed to master. There's another concept in Git where you can create another branch of an original branch. Say here from master, we branched off and created a new branch and we named it dev. I hope you won't be confused here, although the illustration is a little confusing, but the new branch, dev, when we created the new branch for master, dev was created, but dev is not pointed to master. It's pointed to 807. And whenever you create another branch, your point of view automatically jumps to that new branch. So let me go back. So when we created dev, Automatically, head, which is our point of view, pointed to the new branch, which is dev. Although dev is still pointed to 807. So our point of view, dev and master are all pointing to 807. Say we created a new commit on the dev branch. What happens is, Dev will now point to that new commit. And accordingly, head will also point to that new commit since we're currently looking at the dev branch. So what if we wanted to look at master again? We can do that. That's a simple command. And that's what in Git terms, that's called checking out a branch. So we check out master, which allows our point of view to jump from dev to master. So now, head is now pointing to master. The code base is now again on 807. And again, we create another branch of master. Head automatically points to that new branch. And if we create another commit on that branch, that new branch will point to that new commit. And head will also point to that new commit. So as you can see here, we now have diverging chains or diverging git histories master is pointed to 807 dev is pointed now to 508 
and the new branch is pointed to B52. Currently, our point of view is also pointed to B52. So this is the state of our code base from our point of view. Note for blockchain enthusiasts. This is pretty similar to forking. But in blockchain, that's not really encouraged and seldom done unless there's a real change that needs to be done on that blockchain. But in Git, this is highly encouraged because this is how we collaborate with other developers. So again, we can check out master, which allows our point of view to change from the feature branch, which is feet branch name, to master. So again, our point of view is on commit 807. When we create a commit on the master branch, again, master will, will now point to that new commit and also our point of view changes to 9E0. Now, master, dev, and the new branch or the new feature branch all have the same parent, which is 807. But these three branches are now on separate Git histories. So what if you want to apply changes from one branch to another branch? Say a colleague of yours is working on a branch and uh, you want to get the changes that he's been working on and apply it to the branch that you're on. Let's go back to the previous slide. What if this changes on dev, you want to apply those to the master branch? How can you do that? Here's another illustration. This is another block signifying a commit. Currently, we are on master. For example, we created another commit on that branch and we branched off master and created the dev branch. And on dev branch, we created another commit. Then maybe your colleague continued on working on master, so he generated another commit. While he's doing that, maybe you added a few more changes on dev branch. What if you're finished with your work on dev branch and want to apply it on the master branch, which by convention is the main branch of Git projects. We do a Git merge. So what happens in a Git merge is, especially for this instance, upon merging dev onto master, Git will create a merge commit, especially since there have been different timelines now or Git histories now between master and dev. So it needs to create this merge commit. And that merge commit contains all the information of two parent commits. This commit on master and this commit on dev. So now we can say that dev is now merged into master. But if you notice, dev didn't jump from this commit to the merge commit. Only master jumped from here to here. That's because we merged dev into master, but we didn't merge master into dev. So dev doesn't know that this merge commit happened. You, you can still continue on working on the dev branch and merge in the future to master, or even the other way around. You can merge master onto dev. That's a little confusing, but as you work more with Git, you'll get it. It's easy to get. It's harder to explain. So there are times when Git merges create problems or issues within one or more files. For example, here we have two branches, master and your branch. So on master, there's a file that has three lines and we branched off and changed the second line. Then someone on master changed that same line. And upon merging, since that second line has been changed on both branches, Git would not know which change should it honor and which change should it discard. 
So Git creates this weird text on the file, which has the merge conflict. This is called a merge conflict, by the way, where a, a certain line or a few lines have been changed on both branches. So here, line two has been changed on both master and the new branch, and Git doesn't know what to do with it. So it creates this blob of uh, text. What this signifies is the upper section is changes on your branch and the lower section signifies the changes from the original branch what we did here is we're merging master into the new branch if the, if it's the other way around this would be a flip if you merge your branch to master line two would be on this upper section and second line will be on the lower section so if this happens to you relax because Git is just saying that, hey, I don't know what to do with this. You would need to resolve this yourself. And it's pretty easy to do that. Admittedly, when I was starting out, it was a panic-inducing moment whenever Git, Git conflicts happened. But believe me, it's, it's okay. I guess that's for the, uh, the concepts of Git. Let's get down to actually coding, a demonstration of the basic Git commands. These are the common Git commands that we'll be discussing. Let's get started. Just want to take note that I won't be discussing how to install Git on your system because we all have different operating systems. Mine is Linux and some of you might be using Windows or Mac. Uh, let me just show you their downloads page. So this is git-sem.com slash downloads. And this is the page where you can download and inst install Git on your system. So I encourage you to just head on to this page and click on your system. Let us now jump onto the terminal. I am on the Omdino project, which has some folders here from my previous participation. Let me create a new folder and change our folder to the newly created folder, which is now, of course, we know that this is empty. The way you initialize a git project is with the command git init. So what this does is it creates a hidden folder named .git. So inside the .git folder are a bunch of files and folders that we don't need to understand right now, but you can explore. Admittedly, I've never even bothered, but maybe one of these days I would. So again, we are on the folder which has no files except for the .git files and another thing to note is you can do git init on any code base or repository for example if i had lots of files here i could just execute that command and uh, the whole project will be git enabled already but for now since we are starting from scratch there's no files yet if I run git status, this shows you the status of the current code base according to git. Currently, it's saying that we are on branch master. We haven't made any git commit yet. And it's saying that there's nothing to commit since there are no files. So let's create a file. Let's call it sample.txt. Sample.txt is just a plain text file. So let's do git status again so now git detects that hey there's a new file it's called sample.txt but i'm not currently tracking it so what this means is git is not monitoring the changes of that file so even if we change it or add content or delete content in the sample.txt file 
Git would not be able to detect the changes. So we need to add this file to Git's tracking system. And we do that by first adding it to our Git staging. Actually, this is kind of confusing because although we did a Git add, it's not added to Git yet. It's just being staged. This is what I mean. So let's do its status again. Here, it's now saying that, hey, you have a new file. So we've added it to the tracking system, sort of, but we haven't yet committed it. To actually add the file to Git's versioning system, we need to commit it to Git. So by committing it, it opens up your editor and allows you to add your description here. But we won't do that this way. There's a shortcut. Since the commit message is empty, we didn't add our uh, description. The commit was aborted. But there's a shorthand. By doing this, we commit the file with the message in it sample.txt. So now, as you can see, the commit was successful. Let me just clear the terminal. This is another command, git log, which will show you the history of the current branch. As you can see, we are on the master branch and head is pointed to master. We already saw this in a previous slide. It shows you the information of the commit. Let's exit from that by pressing Q. So now we have a file that's committed into Git. What happens now if we change the file? Let me open up my editor. Currently, it's, it's empty. Let's add a few text here. save this so sample that text has the text first line second line and third line do a git log again uh i mean a git status again so now git is smart enough to detect that you changed or modified sample that text so again we need to commit those changes Right now, it's not committed yet to Git. We stage again the file. Dot represents all files that are uh, that have been changed, or you could also you could also do sample dot text since we only have one file. But for more often, you would you would use git add and dot. So it status again. Git is showing that sample.txt is staged and ready for committing. Let's add another line to sample.txt. Fourth line. Oops. Let me, let me save this. Okay, good. Yeah. So we now have four lines. And if we do a status, and now we have our previous change, which was already staged. And we made another change, and it's saying that those changes are not staged for commit. You can see the difference here, that you can stage the file, then change the file after staging. Git would detect that you have a previous change that hasn't been committed yet, and another change that hasn't been staged yet. So let's add that again. And we do a git status. All changes are now staged as one. Before I commit this, let me unstage it by using git restore dash dash stage all files. So now it's unstaged. I want to see this. Using git diff, it would tell you what changed since the last commit. We added four lines, and Git will indicate that it would highlight in green the changes that you added. So we added four lines, and then there are four green lines here. 
And as another indication, it adds the plus sign before each line. So that's get dip. Again, let's add the file, stage it, then commit. Add for line. So if we do a good git log, we now have two commits. Commit 84A, which is our most recent commit, and its parent. 392. If you could observe, master is now pointed to that new commit. And head is also pointed to that new commit because it's pointing to master. Now what if you want to create another branch? You can do that by this command. New branch. Oh, no, no, no. Not, not, this, not, not this command. Git checkout. I mean, dash b new branch. So what this does is we create the branch and we check out that branch. Dash B is short for branch or new branch. Now that we are on the new branch, let's again edit the file and maybe delete this file, this line. Now again, Git will detect that the file has been modified. Do a git diff. Git tells us that from the previous commit, we deleted the third line. It highlights it in red and adds the minus sign on front of the line. The other lines are unchanged. So we add that. And commit. Delete. Third line. By the way, the convention uh, on commit messages the tense should be active. It completes the sentence, this commit will blank. So this commit will delete third line. Now that we've committed it, we do a git log. We now have three commits. If you will observe, head is now pointing to the new branch and master is still pointing to the old commit and new branch is now pointing to the new commit. Let's exit that. Now we've finished our work on the new branch and we want to merge the new branch to the old branch, which is master. We can now check out master and do the git log again. Again, we are back to two commits. So where did that new commit go? We can do this, something like this. So now, you would see again that head is pointed to master and new branch is pointing to that new commit and master is still pointing to the old commit. So it's a long command. It's git log one line, dash dash graph, dash dash decorate, and dash dash all. But if you want to know more, you could just do git log dash dash help. Yeah, and uh, there's these uh, list of flags that you can use. Anyway, so we want to merge the new branch to our master branch. We could do that by doing this. By the way, before I do that again, you could list the available branches by using git branch command. And you would see that there's master and new branch on your local machine. So let's merge new branch into master. So what happened here is a fast forward merge. I won't be discussing what fast forward is. We don't have any time anymore. If you would see, the new commit is now applied to the master branch. The third line is now gone. And if you do a git log, master also has that recent commit. On master branch, let me add back again third line. So now let's commit this.
and do a git log so if you can see new branch is on the be3 and master is now on 501 i'm just mentioning the first three characters of the commit hash so we are on 501 and let's check out new branch again we are on be3 and maybe let's do something here third line let's add third line oops sorry forgot to stage it so now we are on 502 And if you could see that uh, we have diverged, master is on 501, new branch is on 502. So let's try to merge new branch into the master. Oh, master. Now we have created a merge conflict. So let's open up. Sample the text. We saw this earlier that get detected that for the same line there's two changes, so it couldn't determine which line to honor and which line to drop. Let's just tell get that for this instance we need the third line spelled out. So we effectively resolve the git merge conflict. In the real world, in collaborative projects, you would need to do this with the owner of the other branch so that you could uh, decide among yourselves which one to delete and which one to retain. It's a very collaborative exercise. So we save this and exit. We do git status. It's saying us that we have unmerged paths and it's now telling us that we could fix it or we can abort the merge or we could yeah fix it then proceed with the merge so let's add the file note that it's telling us that in both branches sample.txt was modified and that's what's causing the merge conflict so upon adding and uh, doing a git status, it's telling us that, hey, you are still on merge mode. A merge is still ongoing. And there was a conflict, but the conflict is now fixed. So we can now proceed with the commit. Now, this is what I told you earlier, that it now creates a merge commit. So we do a git log. As you can see, new branch is now merged into master, but new branch still stays on 502 and can still uh, diverge from the git history. And master can now continue on from 28p. So I guess that's it for local git. Let's go back to our slides. So those are the most common commands in git. And in my opinion, they cover around 60, 70, 80% of use cases out there. So you would be able to use Git for a very long time by only using these commands. Now that we've demonstrated that, we are now going to explore GitHub, which is a very important tool in collaboration, especially in open source. Since Omdina projects are mostly open source, it is very important for us to learn how to use GitHub and its project management tools. Let's hop on to the GitHub website. If you don't have an account with GitHub, I suggest that you just head on to github.com and create one by signing up. There's just 
one thing that's a little complicated in that when signing in via the command line they are very big on security so i suggest going to the github documentation and heading on to account security and under authentication to github browse to this section authenticating with the command line and just follow the instructions here there are also tons of blog posts out there that discuss this so i won't be discussing this because this is time consuming so this is my github profile page and i've already populated it with information about myself again i won't be discussing this instead let us just jump into creating a repository so why do we need to create a repository on github earlier we already created a code base on our local and initiated it as a git repository but what if we want to collaborate with other people and allow them to sync their changes with our changes so we need something like github to provide a service to allow us to do just that to sync up changes on our local with changes from other developers so let's create a new repository I will name this as Omdina Demo. Let's keep the other options blank. So now we have here a ready-made repository, but we still have to connect this to our local repository. To do that, we can follow these instructions. I'll copy this link that they provide. I'm using on my local SSH type of authentication, so I'm getting the link for that. If you don't know what that is again just go back to the documentation we are now back on the command line terminal on the left is still the folder of our current project to connect our current project with a repository on github we need to instruct git with the command git remote add and we provide it with the values for the for the alias that we want to call our repository and the link to the repository it's common convention that if if your current project only has one remote repository to call that remote repository as origin we provide origin as the alias for our remote repository again by common practice and paste here the url that we copied earlier so this command will list the current remote repositories associated with our local project so we added just one remote repository but as you can see it's listing two why because git allows you to add a repository for each fetch and push operation since we added origin as a remote repository by default it adds it as both fetch and push repository which means that the re remote repository that we created is the same repository whenever we fetch changes from the remote repository and push changes to a remote repository of the name origin now that we've added the remote repository to our local project the last thing that we need to do is to push our changes to that remote repository and instruct git to sync up the remote and local copies of the project we do that by using the git push command but since this is our first time pushing changes from the master branch to the remote repository we need to provide two arguments to the command the first one is the alias we provided to our remote repository which is origin the second argument is the branch that we want to push and we added the flag dash dash set dash upstream to tell git that we want the local master branch to track the remote master branch so let's do that 
So what happened is since there's no master branch yet on the remote repository, it created one. And since we added that flag, it set up the tracking between the local and remote copies of the master branch. So now if we do a git status, it would now say that our branch is now up to date with origin slash master, which is telling us that the local master branch is now tracking the remote master branch hosted on the origin remote repository. So let's go back to our repository and refresh. So now we have here our sample.txt, which we created earlier. And we are now able to inspect the file directly on GitHub. If you would observe, on our local, we have two branches, master and dev. But on the remote repository, we only have one branch, which is master. That's because we only pushed master. If we pushed dev onto the remote repository, we would have a couple of branches here, master and dev. So what if a colleague wants to obtain a synchronized copy of this repository on his machine? He could do that by clicking on code and copying the link provided. Let's imagine that the right side command line terminal is on the laptop of your colleague. He is on the Omdina folder. He can now pull the repository on his local by using the git clone command and providing the link that he copied earlier and maybe you can rename the folder git session copy so now it will pull the code base from github and dump everything to the git session copy folder we now see that we have git session copy here change our directory into that folder, we now see that we have sample.txt. And if we list our remote repository, by default, origin would be our newly created GitHub repository. So from this, I hope you could already see the power of Git. You could now create changes on your local, commit them, then use the push command to push your changes from your current branch to the remote repository. And your colleague can now pull changes from your repository to his local. You could also do that. If your colleague has changes, you could also pull those changes into your branch. All those by using git push and git pull. And there's another command, git fetch. The difference is git pull does a fetch of the changes and attempts to merge the changes to your current branch. While git fetch just fetches all the changes without merging. I don't have time to discuss more about this, but it's really easy to pick up. Only three commands, git pull, git push, and git fetch. Let us now move on to the project management features of GitHub to best illustrate how GitHub works effectively as a project management tool. Let's open up one of the biggest organizations in GitHub. FreeCodeCamp. If you're not familiar with FreeCodeCamp, they are arguably the largest educational content provider for programming and computer science. So this is their organization page on GitHub, and they have here a lot of repositories. Let me find here chapter. So chapter is FreeCodeCamp's attempt to create an alternative to event organizing services like meetup.com and Facebook events. But this is open source and they want to provide it free to communities. So we could see on the top, we are currently on the code base tab, which is the meat of what Git is. The other tabs are mostly about project management. In a few sections for automation, like actions, let us explore the project management sections of GitHub for this repository. So this is the issues tab. And in terms of project management, the smallest unit in project management is called an issue. 
it may be called other terms in other project management platforms, but usually it is called an issue. In Trello, it might be a card, but in platforms like Jira and GitHub, it's called an issue. Don't ask me why they are calling these terms as such, because I don't know myself. And sometimes I think that the names are very confusing, especially to beginners. But it is what it is. So, so what is an issue? It's just anything, actually. It may be a bug report, a suggestion, a question. Here it's a mix of everything. Let's open up one issue. Let's pick something that's very active. This one. So this issue has a few parts. It has a title and a description. And everyone can chime in with their thoughts. If it's a question, people will answer. And if it's a suggestion, people will chime in and sometimes challenge the suggestion or tell it it's a really great idea. And sometimes if the suggestion is adopted by the project, they will attach here a pull request. A pull request is a request to adopt your changes to a certain project. So for example, if you want to add features to chapter, you could create a pull request. And just like in the GitHub issues, a pull request can contain discussions, but discussions here are more directed towards code. So you could, you could point out certain lines of code in the changes that you made and have discussions on those lines. And if the changes in the pull request are acceptable to the maintainers of the project, they could accept the pull request and merge your changes into the code base. I won't go into details further since I am pressed for time. Another awesome feature of GitHub is repository projects where you could create a Kanban board for your issues. So these are issues from here. So some of the issues here have been adopted and made as part of a Kanban board so that everyone can see the progress of each ticket or issue. So if you click on a ticket, you would see the issue and the number of comments and of course the description. So if you're familiar with Kanban style project management, this is very, very useful. Instead of using something like Trello, you could just track everything inside of GitHub. And you could also use this feature called the uh, wiki, which is a smaller version of like a Wikipedia, but specifically for your repository. Here they're using the wiki section for meeting notes and some documentation. I'm hoping that you could see the possibilities in project management, especially in open source that GitHub offers. I encourage everyone to explore GitHub further because there are still a lot of features that I wasn't able to discuss. There is one caveat when using Git. Git works well for files that are text-based or plain text files. You'll know when the file is a plain text file when you open it with your notepad and you see readable text. You can read the text. But if you open a file with a notepad and you see a bunch of gibberish, most likely that's a binary file. And Git has trouble with binary files. It cannot detect changes in binary files. Since Git is for code, and code is mostly just text. They are just plain text files, even if the file extensions are different. These are just plain text files, so they fit very well with Git. But there are some files that store code, but are actually binary files. One such example, unfortunately, is Jupyter Notebooks. But fortunately, there are tools out there to help Git understand these binary files. One such tool is ReviewNB. 
So what Review NB does is it reads a Jupyter Notebook and allows Git to determine the changes within the Jupyter files. For example, here on their front page, they have here an illustration of how Review NB works. There are changes here on these lines marked by red and green and it also is able to determine the changes on your figures the size of this figure increased so review nb was able to detect that i encourage you to explore this i haven't used this myself yet but from what i've read this is often used by data scientists who use jupyter notebooks now that We've covered all the basic stuff about Git and GitHub. What's the next steps? These are some of my suggested further learnings. Just a word of warning, some of these or most of these will destroy Git histories. So be very careful. But I implore you to, to experiment, of course, in your own time. One thing I can say is it's okay to make mistakes. Just go ahead and uh, experiment with them and learn. So we have your git stash, git rebase, git cherry pick, git commit, dash dash amend, git reset, git push with the dash dash force flag, git remote, git blame, and this is very important, the git ignore file. There are a lot more out there, but uh, these are, uh, I think, logical f next steps in your uh, git learning journey so a few tips again to accelerate your git learning don't be afraid to make mistakes it's easy to revert things if you mess up your branch just be careful not to mess up other people's branches especially the main or the master branches embrace the command line be the hacker you were born to be again branches are free if you want to experiment create new branches you could just delete them after you're finished with them you can destroy these branches so create branches if you're uh, uncertain of what to do or afraid of destroying your current branch create a new branch and experiment there see if it works then you can delete that branch then go back to your previous branch and apply what you've learned if working in a collaborative environment never ever resolve merge conflicts alone this is very important because if the conflict involves two or more people, you need to decide among yourselves which code is retained and which code or which lines of code should be deleted during merge conflict sessions. Join and observe other people's merge conflict resolution sessions. This is a very, very effective learning exercise. If you hear in your team or in your company, that a merge conflict happened join in and listen to the conversation and observe how they resolve the conflict git is a reflection of your team's processes and work dynamic if you're having a hard time with git improve your processes first before fixing git workflows this is again another important point in which you don't blame git if you're having a hard time with merge conflicts merging workflows fix your culture first your workflows before reflecting the changes in your workflows into git so i guess that's it for me thank you and i'm now open for q a